We really appreciate that. And I, my career of uh, dealing with Daring and Farm Bureau and uh, things in the legislature, we really appreciate you. And help me welcome Governor Edwin Edwards. Thank you. Be close Thank you. Be seated. Thank you. Be, be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. As you know, I have been away for a while. And when I was preparing to address you, I called my good friend, Mike Strain, to bring me up to date on what was happening in the farming community and in Louisiana generally. We spent a long time on the telephone. He was very gracious, very informative gave me everything that I needed to prepare for this, for this occasion. And then he came before me and told you everything I was gonna tell you. <laughs> so much for the speech I brought. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, it was great. And I must say that you told these people the same thing you told me. And that's unusual for a politician. <laughs> you know, looking at this herd of beautiful, uh, Holstein reminded me that years ago when I was running for the state senate, I went to see a farmer to ask for his vote. And we had scheduled an appearance for me to be there in that farm and on, and on his farm. And he had invited all of his neighbors. And for some reason, which I'm yet to figure out, no one showed up but him. And so after waiting around for a half an hour and no one came, I said to him, I said, well, it doesn't look like anybody's going to be here. I guess I'll go on and try to make my next appearance. He said, well, let me tell you something. I'm a dairy farmer, and every day I go out to feed my cattle. I load my pickup truck with hay or grain, and when the cows show up, I feed them. He said, if they all show up, I feed them everything in the truck. If only one shows up, I feed that one. That's my job. I said, I guess you're telling me I should go ahead and make my speech even though you're the only one here. He said, that's right. <laughs> so I gave him a good two-hour speech <laughs> in the sunshine. When I got through, I jumped off the back of his pickup truck, and I said, how was that? He said, not bad, but I forgot to tell you, when only one cow shows up, I don't give her the whole load. <laughs> But I, I love being around farmers. They're so willing to tell you exactly how it is. They don't try to pull in their punches. Went to see another fellow, and I was talking to him and telling him about what I was going to do. I was going to, if I got elected, I was going to pave his gravel road. And if I got elected, I was going to help rebuild a school that needed some repairs. And the more I told him about what I was going to do, the more he kept telling me, my cow is dead. And I talked to him about something else that I was going to do. Same thing. You don't understand. My cow is dead. So after doing that for a few moments and getting the same response from him, I figured that something is wrong with the fellow. He doesn't understand what I'm saying. No use for me to waste my time here. I got in my car and drove to the farm half a mile down the road. And I stopped and I introduced myself and told the farmer that I had met his neighbor, but I said, what's his problem? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, something's wrong with him. He said, why? I said, every time I told him what I was going to do when I got elected, he kept telling me his cow was dead. His cow was dead. And his form, the former said, don't you know what he was trying to tell you? I said, no, what was he trying to say? He wants you to know he's got no use for your bull. <laughs> You heard about the conditions of agriculture from your commissioner, who, by the way, is doing a great job and doing so under some difficult circumstances. I know he's suffered some serious budget cuts, and it's somewhat difficult to get the kind of, all the kind of people you need to do a great job, but he's done wonders with it, and I think you should be very proud of him. And Mike, if you don't hear anything else that I say tonight, I'm going to give you some advice. That's a good answer to your problem of your budget. 
and that is, three years from now, run for governor. <laughs> I, you couldn't have a better fellow. I know you'd hate to lose him as your commissioner, but you couldn't have a better fellow. Like he said, my wife Trina is a Republican. After all those years and all those Democratic campaigns, I finally found a use for a Republican. <laughs> you sleep with them. <laughs> I know, I know some of you raise your eyebrows and wonder what the devil I'm do she's doing with me. I know what I'm doing with her. <laughs> wonder what she's doing with me. And I never figured it out either. But I'll tell you this, as you know, I was given a vacation. <laughs> and the last year I was in Oakdale, she read my book and wrote me as about 3,000 people did. By the way, while I was in prison, I got over 35,000 letters from people, which helped sustain me while I was there. And so I had a form letter printed out to send to everybody who wrote me about the book. to say thank you for buying the book, glad you enjoyed it. I hope you realize that it's as much about my life as it is about what happened in Louisiana for the past four decades. And so she wrote me back and she said very caustically, I got your form letter <laughs> and I thought possibly you would give me a more personal response since I'm a Republican and never had the opportunity to vote for you. She was too young by the time I ran uh, the last time. And she said, I'm still very intrigued with you and I'd like very much to meet you. And I live in Alexandria, which is only 30 miles from where you are. And she said, I'd like to visit you. So I wrote her back and said, well, my visiting list is limited. I have a large family, a large number of political supporters who visit me and it's difficult to arrange to get people on the list. Whereabout she wrote back and sent a, a picture of herself, <laughs> which I looked at and said, probably about 30 years old. The picture, not her. And she said, I still would like to visit you. Well, when I saw the picture, that was like throwing a rubber raft to a drowning man. Here I was, 80 years old in prison, and this lady wants to come visit me, so I immediately arranged that. And see, she showed up. And whether you believe it or not, spent all that visiting time from 8 in the morning till 3, and all she could do was buy me a hamburger out of the visiting machines. I couldn't even buy her a Coke because I, they didn't let us have any money. She doesn't have the same attitude now. Uh, <laughs> When we got through talking and visiting time was over with, she said, if you don't mind, I'd like to come back. And of course, I was happy to have her back. And whether you believe it or not, for the next 11 months, every visiting day, on Christmas Day, on New Year's Day, on Thanksgiving Day, or every Saturday and Sunday, except one, when she had to take her child to a soccer match, she spent from 8, from eight in the morning till 3 in the afternoon. And of course, being as attractive as she is, she attracted the attention of 140 inmates who were living there. And whenever 8 o'clock in the morning came on Saturdays and Sundays, they would line up at the window to watch her walking <laughs> across the parking lot. And I thought for a while she was coming to visit me, but I think she was interested in the attention she was getting. But anyhow, that relationship blossomed into something that you only read about and hear about, but it happened, and I'm very proud of it and very pleased. And could not have been happy. You know, I like to tell people, they sent me to prison for life, but I came back with a good-looking wife. <laughs> well, I grew up on a farm. My father was a sharecropper. He had a 40-acre tract of land that belonged to one of his aunts. As I saw this wonderful equipment, which runs into the hundreds of thousands of dollars, I thought about my life as a farm boy. I picked cotton for a nickel a hundred. We sold cotton for six cents a, a pound. And things were so different then. We grew, we grew our own 
garden. We grew sugar cane, but we cut it with a cane knife. Anybody here know what a cane knife is like? <laughs> Believe me, if you want to get some arm, arm attachment, you cut a half an acre of cane with a cane knife. My father also ran a small syrup mill, and he made syrup for, for the family and also for our neighbors who had cane. We suffered through the advent of the cane borer, because prior to that, we were raising ribbon cane, which is a lot softer, and it's peeling, and a little juice, lar larger and juicier. But the cane borer destroyed that, and thank goodness, technology, the attention of the government, both at the state and, lo and national level, managed to eradicate the cane borer with the use of the cane, which you now have, which is an example of what government and industry can do working together. Then, of course, we also had the problem with the boll weevil that came here from Mexico. When I was picking cotton, cotton stalks were generally taller than I was. I was about this tall as a young, young teenager. Of course, you had to pick cotton in three different seasons because you couldn't, the bowls would not ripen all at the same time because of the size of the cotton plant. Now, of course, the technology and what has been developed by the cotton industry, the plants are very small, they can, bowls ripen at the same time, you pick it all at one time, and it's a much more efficient m way of doing business. We milked our own cows. We drank milk before it was homogenized and before it was pasteurized. And <laughs> I never suffered from it. <laughs> but things have just changed, and now as the farmer has showed you and told you it's an industry which is very important. You know, unfortunately, if you ask an average fourth grader where milk comes from, he'd say Walmart or Winn Dixit, and or comes or it comes in a in a carton. Unfortunately, much of the urban community and the young people don't know what goes on on a farm. But I want to congratulate both, all three of the farmers that were selected as finalists and also as the finalists because to be selected for an honor by your peers is the greatest honor of all because they are the ones who know what you're doing and the value of what you're doing. So you have my, con my, my congratulations. Now then I want to go into something else. First of all, I'm going to tell you, if you don't hear anything else that I tell you, if any of you use any kind of machinery to pump water or irrigate or use it, or any kind of stationary machinery that is operating on diesel, and you can find an available gas line within any reasonable distance to you. You take my word and as soon as you can, you try to run a line from where your machinery is to the closest available gas because I'm going to, as I'm going to elaborate in a moment, the price of diesel and gasoline is going to continue to escalate natural gas for at least the foreseeable future will be a much more efficient and much more uh, cheaper fuel. Having said that, in 1971, when I became governor, oil was selling for about $8 a barrel. We were collecting 25 cents a barrel severance tax on the oil. I prevailed upon the legislature to change the method by which we collected the severance tax on oil from 25 cents a barrel to 12 and a half percent of value. Important because it's a declining resource. And 70 percent of the oil being produced in Louisiana then and now goes out of state. Therefore, the tax imposed upon the oil as it comes out of the ground is paid for largely by out-of-staters using our natural resources, which is now declining. When I became governor, we were producing almost a million barrels of oil a day. The last inventory showed that we were getting 76 million barrels a year, a great difference. And the production is going to continue to reduce itself by an estimated 1.4% for the next 10 years. Therefore, it's important that we take advantage of the production of oil as it comes out of the ground because it is declining in, rev in uh, resources and it is being used mainly by out-of-staters who are getting the benefit of our oil. 
Now, I was born in 1927, as he said. That was the year of a flood. My mother, believe it or not, dropped the cotton sack on the seventh day of August and walked home to give birth to me. Her mother was a self-taught midwife, and my mother was a self-taught midwife who delivered over 1,800 children, mostly to poor women in the area. She was paid a chicken, a bucket of syrup, sometimes $2, sometimes a sack of potatoes. She did it because she loved people, and she did what she could to help people in our area. When I ran for governor the first time, I rarely went to any place south of Interstate 10 that I did not run into somebody who was delivered by my mother or whose family had somebody delivered by my mother, and it was a source of great consolation to me. My father, as I said before, was a sharecropper. We did not have the kind of equipment you have now. I grew up walking behind a middle buster or, a, you know what a middle buster is? I guess you do. <laughs> Most of you people here are too young to remember what that was. But we, behind a horse or a mule or b behind a plow. When I, as I said before, when we cut cane, we did it with a cane knife. We picked cotton by hand. I picked cotton, I, was, I could pick 200 pounds of cotton a day. I really could. But I picked cotton with a Mexican fella I never met before, first Mexican I ever saw. He could pick 500 pounds of cotton. He started an hour before daybreak and he was picking two hours after dark. Well, we got up at, you got up at 1.30 to milk the cows? We got up at 1.30 in the morning to take a wagon that was loaded the afternoon before, loaded with 1,500 pounds of cotton, to drive eight miles into town to the gin, and sat there all day long while they ginned, hoping to make a 500-pound bale of cotton out of 1,500 pounds of lint. In those days, you could almost pay for the cost of the ginning by selling the seed. By the way, cotton is one of the few products where Everything is used, the seed and the lint. It's a great, great thing. And I'm very proud of the fact that Louisiana has always been a very big cotton producing state. Rice, of course, soybeans, agriculture, and of course, forestry, which many people don't think about in, in, as an agricultural pursuit, but it is very important in Louisiana. It's important to our economy. And as I said before, I want you to learn this from me. In a few years, the population of this world is going to be nine and a half billion people. They say by the middle of the century, it'll be close to 10 billion people. Now, what does that mean? All these wars and all this trouble we have in these other areas, largely because of the lack of food. People wanting something that we have that they need to survive. Now, that's going to continue. And let me tell you this, as Mr. Strain can tell you. This country alone in the world has the land, the technology, the rainfall, the ability to irrigate, and the ability to harvest and plant, harvest, and process food to help feed the world. You and th your children in the business are going to be in the forefront of the contribution that America can make to the world as hunger begins to spread. Now, the first job that was ever given to anybody was that of a farmer. God told Adam to take care of the plants and the trees in the Garden of Eden. After a while, God realized that Adam couldn't handle it by himself. And that's probably true now. We just, we men, men folk can't handle things by ourselves. So he provided Adam with a helpmate. Took a rib from him. Not from, didn't take anything from his head because he didn't want Eve to be on top of him or from his knees to be on the bottom of him, but from his side to be his helpmate. You know, they say that in six days God made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and then he rested. Thank goodness. Because after that, he made Eve, and since then, neither he nor man nor woman has rested. <laughs> <laughs> but it sure is good to have you ladies around, because without you, the world would be a whole lot different. <laughs> now, 
Here's what I want to close on. One of the reasons that you're paying as much as you're paying for diesel and gasoline, and one of the reasons that food prices are rising is because the cost of production is increasing, and one of the reasons is because we got our nose stuck in too many places where it doesn't belong. We've got to learn that those people over there are not like us. They have a different religion. They have a different attitude. We can fight them till hell freezes over and just like seven or eight other nations have tried and when it's all over with, they'll be just like they are. What we need to do now that we've, now that we've killed Osama bin Laden and, and Gaddafi, we need to bring our people home Quit spending all that money and that treasury and that blood of our fine young men and women doing the impossible. Those people were like that 2,500 years before Christ was born, and they'll be like that 25 years from now, 2,500 years from now. We are in the wrong place at the wrong time trying to do the worst thing possible. We're spending our country into bankruptcy, and the only way we can protect ourselves from future onslaughts from him is to keep our country financially solvent and safe and continue building up our military to where we can be prepared. Otherwise, we're going to bankrupt ourselves and they will take over a bankrupt country. That is the most foolish thing that I, 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 I cannot understand what has happened to this country and why we are in, still in Germany after all these years since this World War II ended. We're still in Japan. We're still in Korea. We're still in South Vietnam. We're in dozens of countries spending our money and going broke and accomplishing nothing. We pay Pakistan a billion five hundred million dollars a year. And what do they do with it? They support the Taliban. And what the Taliban do it? Fighting and killing our young men and women in Afghanistan. We need to take our people home, put them to work developing our energy, put them to work developing our infrastructure, spend the money where we need it in our country, take care of ourselves. Can't understand it. Why the president is refusing to approve the pipeline from Canada? What a ridiculous thing. 20,000 jobs waiting to be had, equipment and people ready to do the job, and while that's wonderful, it's not nearly as wonderful as the fact that we need the oil that Canada's going to sell to China if we don't take it by the pipeline. And you know what China's going to do with it? They're going to make some useless toys out of the energy they get from the oil they buy from Canada, which we didn't buy. And you know who's going to end up buying it? Us. <laughs> I went to two or three Mardi Gras parades thousands, millions of beads coming from China. $48 a box. I was horrified. All the, hungry, all the hungry people in the world, all the hungry children in the world, and all that waste, those beads thrown on the street, people tramping on them, cars driving. Why? What are we doing? I, 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 I don't understand. I just want you to know that I'm proud of the fact that I was born on a farm. I'm proud of the fact that my father was a farmer. I'm proud of the fact that one of the best, most welcome visitors we had when I was a child was the county agent. They still have them? Yes. Well, you pay attention to them because they know what they're doing and they'll keep you abreast of what's happening in the industry. They were very important to my father and to the farmers in my area. And so was the demonstration agent who helped my mother know how to preserve things and, and to do things to prepare food and, and sow and take care of our household duties. Very important people in our, in our day and age, and I hope they're still there doing that. Although now you can take a computer, punch up Google, and just about find out anything you need to know without talking to anybody else. I should have done that, Mike, instead of calling you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm a Democrat, married a Republican. I have great Republican friends, always have had. Because I tried not to be a Democrat, I tried to be a public official. I tried to take care of the needs of my people. So you hear some people talk about 
bad things that I've done. They say things about me, some that are true, some are not. Some that are not true, I wish were true. Some are true, I wish were true. Some bad things are not true that I wish were true, and some bad things that are said are not true that I wish were true. But that neither here nor there. Whatever you have heard about me, I was controversial. I spoke out. I, I never hid from anything. I did my job. As he has said, when people came to me, I said, it can be done and it'll be done, or I said, it can't be done and it's not going to be done, and it wasn't. That's the way I was. But one thing that I never did was to fool around with your money, although I'm sure you've heard that. <laughs> Let me tell you something about that. That's impossible. As Mr. Strain knows, the money that's collected in this state goes to the state treasurer, and only the treasurer can write checks. The governor can't write checks. I couldn't have stolen money if I had wanted to, and I didn't want to. But I'll tell you what I did do. In 1986, I wrestled from the federal government a $640 million settlement of an old lawsuit <coughs> involving the Thailand. Didn't put the money in my pocket, didn't give it to my friends, didn't waste it on useless projects. I took $100 million and gave the school teachers and bus drivers a one-time raise, which was badly needed. The other $540 million I put in a trust fund constitutionally dedicated for education. Since that time, every year, Colleges and universities have enjoyed the benefit of 40 to $60 million of extra money for in research and development or enrichment of programs or whatever use each college wanted to have. You know what's good, too? In all those years, as the money accumulated is now, as you sit here today, contrary to taking money from you, I left a fund which is now worth $1,200,000,000. No other governor in the history of our state left any kind of fund for the people of Louisiana and for those that came after us. No other state in the 50 states of America have such a fund. We're the only one. I'm sure very few of you know that because it's not publicized. However, if I had been caught taking $200 out of it, I'm sure you would have heard about it. <laughs> i close on this. You know, you're farmers, you know what a herd of cattle is, you know what a gaggle of geese is, you know what a pride of lions is. We have n nouns for all groups of animals in the universe. A parliament of owls, I guess, because owls are supposed to be smart. Well, you take a baboon, vicious, stupid, controversial, fighting all the time, no family relationships, dumb and vicious. You know what you call a group of baboons? Get ready. A Congress of baboons. <laughs> I am very disappointed with my government. I sit here and watch what is happening all that is being done, I don't understand, who, don't understand. I keep telling people, you know, I guess I, I'm glad I can't run because if I could have, I would have run and I'd have probably won and then I'd have all these problems. <laughs> but something needs to be done. Years ago, a lawyer and statesman and senator said, this country needs to get out of the affairs of other countries. We need to quit supporting the needs of other countries. Those in charge need to be humble and modest and serve the needs of our people. We need to learn as a nation that we have to balance our budget and take care of the needs of people. We need to learn as a nation that people have to stop relying on those who work and others to take care of their needs and get out and work themselves. Otherwise, our nation will be bankrupt and will fade into nothing. You know who said that? A fellow named Cicero, 50 years before Christ was born. And you know within a matter of a few hundred years, Rome was no longer the nation that it once was. It's going to happen to our country. 
if we don't wake up and see what is happening to us and do something about it before it is too late. It will not happen in my lifetime because I'm 84 years old, but many of you in here will live to experience it. Let us hope that my prediction in this case is entirely wrong and that we will come to our senses and develop our resources and take care of our nation and demean ourselves as honorable citizens who are concerned about each other, but at the same time expect each other to do his or her part to make life in America what it, you, what it once was. I grew up at such a wonderful time in such a wonderful area. We didn't have the drug problem. We didn't have the crime problem. Things were so different. I ate dinner every night with my father and mother. The table wasn't much, but we were there together. My father and mother were home every night. I went to school in a one-room schoolhouse. Had no electricity, no running water. I brought a paper bag of lunch, most of the times a sweet potato or a sandwich that my mother made. And then I rode a bus eight miles into town for the rest of my education before busing was a social and legal issue. I got a good public education, and I like to think I took advantage of it. I love my country. In spite of what has happened to me, I love my country. I love this state. I love this people. I can't tell you, as I sat there for eight years, wondering about what kind of reaction I would get from people when I got out. But it would be impossible to explain to you how people have been generous and nice and kind to me since I got out. I don't know why, but I certainly appreciate it, and I hope someday to convince you and everybody else that while I was there, I never forgot you, and I'm so pleased to learn you never forgot me. Thank you.